people around the world lacking our Earth's most simple and essential resource, water. Kilimanjaro wasn't the end, it's just the beginning. The, uh... do, you, do you find it only just slightly ironic that here we are doing this climb to raise awareness for the global clean water crisis and there was that one day that passed on that mountain where it didn't either rain, snow, hail, sleet. And, and, and here I am looking forward to standing at the top of this almost 20,000 feet and we can't see a goddamn thing. We are completely socked in in, in the worst blizzard <laughs> in the history of the mountain. Yeah, we, had, we had the most inclement weather they had in 15 years on that climb. So it was hail, sleet, snow, you name it. But there were, there were a lot of firsts too. It was, uh, at least in documented history, the largest group to actually climb the mountain. Uh, it was the only group of that size, at least documented, that had a 100% success rate and that everybody made it to the top, which is very, very rare. Camera courage. Nobody wanted to be the one who had to go back, to, <laughs> back down the mountain. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, I think that this just speaks to the um, to the transmedia nature of it. It's a story that, that continues to be told, so no matter where you came in contact with this, whether you saw the film or not, or you ended up going to the website, or you ended up reading about it in a tweet, you were able to, to gather parts of that story. And I, what Kenna said before, I think, is, is true to the success of this whole thing, is that we'll continue to run into people who went on the climb with us, whether they were some of the celebrities or activists, whether it's people who just came in contact with the project tangentially, uh, other partners that had benefited from it, from the UNF Foundation and Nations Foundation. Everybody received a positive hit as a, as a result of this, so much so that we're talking about, okay, well, what, and what's the next thing we could do? How can we leverage this, this cultural cachet that we now have? How can we take what these brands are still looking for in terms of being able to reach that audience and now take it to the, to the next level? And I think, I think the most powerful thing is really about the curation. I think the more, more than anything, we just have too much going on, there's too much happening. Like, I'm, no offense to South by Southwest, but just being in here is a uh, sensory overload to a degree. Um, and the reality is that, that we, need, we need to be able to be given some really clear um, lines of, of, of content and things that we can believe in and understand that it's gonna be true to form. Every one of the brands that were chosen, they weren't, they, they were curated. If you notice, all those, if you go and look for those logos, you'll see all of them are blue. And it's not because I wanted them to be blue, but because each one of those brands represented environmental, um, uh, uh, they, were, they were leaders, they were all leaders in that, in that respect. And I, I think that as we move forward with things like Summit or things going forward in general, I don't, I don't know what everybody's discipline is here and what everybody's involved in. Um, the reality is that the more we can curate things, the more we can give people content that matters and, and stuff that has the impetus that's, that's actually positive, people will be able to gravitate to that and will be able to believe in something again. And it does, ha it does need to have a mystery to it. It does have to have um, you know, these multi-disciplines, but it also just has to be great and it, and it has to be powerful and it has to be something you can believe in. And that's all I have to say about that. I know we just have a, uh, a few minutes left, but we'd love to open it up to questions if anybody has it. There's a microphone running around over there. I have a question for Justin yeah. Wilkes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, yeah, great job of everything. So it was beautifully uh, put together. And, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, transmedia, and it's thrown together haphazardly. I was wondering, what was a kind of unexpected but also a great surprise that you had going in and just putting together everything you can look back at that you that will help you in your future uh, projects? I think from, from my standpoint, you should answer this question too. To Kenna's point about curation, that there was such a, an interesting and eclectic group of people that came together both on screen and, and even more so off screen. And you at times sort of wondered, well, what is this person bringing to the equation or what is this person going to be able to contribute and and in some cases even people themselves were wondering after like day four why why did I agree to do this yet everybody walked out of it with a, a different yet also unified uh, feeling of that they've all done this together we've all now been a part of this thing and, and I think the audience 
also kind of comes out of it, again, depending on how you were exposed to it, with a similar feeling of, I've just experienced this piece of quality content. Maybe I just went to the website, maybe I heard a tweet about it, or maybe I actually took the time and watched the 90-minute broadcast. And I now have a different appreciation for, for what the group of people on screen are actually doing. And I'm inspired as a result of that. And maybe that means I'm going to contribute something to the cause. Maybe it means I'm going to investigate about the cause. Maybe it means I'm going to retweet the cause. But I'm just going to start to think about that, specifically water in this case, in a different way. And I think that how that has now multiplied and just that it, you know, the effect that this world of transmedia does have where you can do one thing and if it's good, it gets spread and it gets spread and it gets spread. I'm continually amazed by how many people were, were impacted by this in, in just different ways and who now want to be a part of it, who now want to instantly come up to us and say, hey, are you going to do another climb? Can I be a part of it? Or what can I do in my school? Or even can I use this documentary and show it somewhere for, for a group that I have? And that's been wonderful just to see that. The fact that we're still talking about something in today's age where you're used to watching something, especially on MTV, and it's essentially disposable content the next day you forget about it. People are still talking about this, and I think that, that speaks to the power of it. Yeah, I would, I would say that, you know, um, the surprising thing and the, mo the most powerful thing to me was realizing that over the years of my life, the relationships that I, that I have are not just surface relationships. I never imagined that I would have more people asking if they can go than, than I could take. You know, I think that's, that was a really powerful thing to see. Um, it, was a, it was something that you can do for your life. It's a life mission for a lot of people, bucket list type of thing to climb a mountain like Kilimanjaro, but to add the fact that you're doing it as a representation of people who cannot represent themselves made it even more powerful. And I think that the, the allies, the other thing I would say, the surprising, not necessarily surprising, but powerful thing that I, I saw was how people were really allies at the end and how they've stuck together as alumni. We just had uh, um, Jessica Beale just put up her birthday for, for clean water and every single person involved with the climb either retweeted or got involved in some way supporting her. Um, it's, we are all together. We've done this one thing together. We have this thing in common and that's the most amazing thing. I, I think across all the disciplines, it was, it was really cool to see how we could, we could bring all of this together too. And I think um, I, one thing that was surprising to me and, and great was in a recession being able to raise the money that was necessary to pull off this event to get brands excited about something um, and to have them spend millions of dollars in media what you don't see in there is the commercial HP shot with us the, the commercial that Procter & Gamble shot with us the fact that Procter & Gamble paid for the documentary these are all very expensive um, ventures and for them to invest that much time and money into a project because they believe in it more than more than anything is is amazing and you realize that these brands are full of people as much as you see a logo and as much as you see a pro product in the store the people that actually are running these companies are, are human beings like us who care about the world that we live in and if you can engage them in that way and realize that they're a part of this world that you live in too they're not just a logo you get a chance to talk to them differently Um, I wonder if you could um, tell us what the timescales were and the milestones from like having that idea that you wanted to do something to actually seeing it happen. And like, what were the, at what point did you say to yourself, this is actually going to happen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? I, that's a good question. I, I started it three years ago the day my dad told me that story. Um, I was still on tour at the time. And... Um, it, it took me two years to get it to the point where I knew it was going to happen. So the first year was just finding people who would even listen to my crazy idea um, and build it with me. And I had a, a partner in crime, a producer that, that supported me by the name of Brooke Fedro, and she supported me in building the idea. The second year was chasing brands during a recession. I mean, and when I say chasing, I mean chasing. Like, I, I went to parties and and sent celebrities to talk to people they didn't know in order for them to help me get them to say yes. I mean, you name the trick, I pulled it. Um, and at the very end of it, it turned out to be a, a, a great result, but it did take me two years to get it going. And on the second year, probably April of the year before last is when I knew it was gonna happen. I think we'll take one last question and then we'll give you guys an opportunity to wrap things up. Cool. 
Could you guys talk about, uh, briefly about the, you mentioned the behind the scenes team. You know, how, how large was that team? How long did it come up with, take to come up with a strategy for hitting all of these platforms? Because obviously in order to have some right. coherent, you needed to have not just the milestones, but an idea of when and where you wanted these to be. How, I mean, was the team large? Yeah, it, we, we consciously wanted to make the most of the media experience, knowing that the days that we were on that mountain, the seven days we were physically on the mountain, was going to be our biggest opportunity to make a, an impact before the, the film came out. And the film came out about three months after, after the climb. Uh, and again, there was no expertise, there was no history of anybody broadcasting live off the side of the mountain to the extent that we were in terms of updating and blog postings and video content and tweet content with satellite phone interviews. So we really cobbled together a team of people that for, for most of them it was their first time doing anything like that and we kind of went into it, you know, well, let's see if it works. Um, and it was incredibly difficult to do. We had one team that was purely dedicated to the marketing and, and sort of PR on the, on the mountain itself. There was about six people that were part of that team. That included video coverage of what was happening that day, literally an editor that was editing in a tent at night. We were beaming that up via a satellite phone, which took a very long time to do. There were certain instances where, depending on where we were in the mountain or the weather, we just simply didn't get a signal. And then we had another crew made up of about uh, just about 20, 25 people that were there just to support the, the documentary itself, the film crew itself. Uh, and we had different teams sort of scattered, hopscotching each other up the mountain because we actually had to climb while we were filming, which again, for the companies that, the, the, the productions that had done it before, like IMAX and even the Today Show went up with Ann Curry, they would hike, they would stop, they would shoot, pack up, hike, stop, shoot. We, we literally kept continuous coverage as best we could, including trying to get a helicopter in, in again, some of the worst weather we've ever experienced. Um, so it was, it was a challenge. But I think all told, the support team was about 35, 40 people, and then plus the climbers itself. That was on the mountain, and then before the mountain. and before that, it was it was just a small group of people pulling it together. I mean, it was it was radical at the point where we were doing television, but before that, it was me and five people. But what we did, what was really the powerful thing about it, was that we actually were able to tap into the agencies that were attached to the brands, and they had a lot of resource to support us with, and. Um, we ended up reusing or repurposing content and supporting it in a different way. We also had an amazing kid named Travis who, who shot like like a banshee and shot everything you can imagine pre-climb and edited it into things that I didn't imagine could be possible. And it was it was actually a small team at first and it grew into this massive team for the climb itself. And uh, honestly, for all the things that we did, we had no idea how we were doing it. It was just happening, and I, I just believe that when something's supposed to happen, it will. And we just hustled and worked 24-7, pretty much.